Hi everyone, my name's Rich and I'm here to show you step by step how you can make your own one of these stunning resin river tables using the Glasscast 50 epoxy resin. I'll be including information on selecting your timber, cutting and preparing the wood and setting up barriers to contain the resin. I'll then show you how to estimate the amount of resin you'll need, tint, measure and mix the resin, seal the wood to prevent air bubbles and of course do the main pour itself. Finally, I'll demonstrate how to flat and polish your table to produce a professional quality piece of furniture. With so much to cover, let's get started. So your river table project is going to start with a piece of wood. We got this great piece of English yew from a local suppliers. Their details are listed below. When you're looking for your piece of timber, of course you want to go for the, for the look that you're after. But the most important things are to make sure that they're both dry and seasoned but also as flat as possible because that'll make the project so much easier. So the first thing we've got to do is cut our piece of wood straight down the middle. That's so we can flip the two pieces over and then we've got the gap for the river. We're going to cut it down on this saw, but you'll probably find that the place you buy the timber from can do this for you. So now the wood's cut, we'll go over and get it prepped and ready for the resin pour. First, we need to look at this bark on the live edge of the wood. You might be tempted to leave this on because it does look great, but the problem is if we did, it would leave a real weak spot in the finished piece and we wouldn't get that solid table that we were looking for. So we're gonna remove this bark all the way along and then key it with some sandpaper. The planks are currently upside down to how we're going to have them on the finished table. But while we've got them this way up, you can see that we've got these knots and these shapes and cracks and we're going to want to fill those while we've got them this way up. For this entire project, we're going to be using the Glasscast 50. This is an amazing resin developed specifically for projects exactly like this one. I'll go into more details about why it's so good later in the tutorial. But for now, we're just going to mix up a small amount so we can fill these knots and cracks while we've got the boards upside down. Where the cracks run to the edge of the board, we'll use some tape to stop the resin from running out. The flash release tape I'm using here is great because it's very strong and the resin won't stick to it. Mix ratios vary between the Glasscast products. With the Glasscast 50, you've got two options. You can mix by weight, which is 100 parts to 45, or you can mix by volume, and that's at two to one. Whichever you choose is fine, but just make sure you get that measurement as accurate as possible. For this small mix, I'm going to use the 100 to 45 by weight mix ratio. I'll keep things simple with 100 grams of resin and 45 grams of hardener. Although this is only a small mix, when mixing epoxies, it's best practice to double pot, mixing thoroughly once in one pot and then transferring to a second pot and mixing again, ensuring that no unmixed resin can find its way onto the job. As you'll see, some of these knot holes and features will actually take quite a bit of resin and need topping up more than once. But this is fine because at least we know the resin is doing its job and making areas like this knot hole or this flaky porous area much stronger. We now need to leave the resin to reach its initial cure, which will take around two days. Now that the resin's gone completely hard, we're going to go over it with a sander so that we take off any high spots. When we flip the boards, they'll then sit nice and flat. We're now ready to set up for the resin pour. The first thing we're going to have to do is make some barriers to contain the resin. We're going to need them at the end and at the bottom to stop the resin from flowing out. To do this, we're going to use polypropylene plastic sheet. The great thing about polypropylene is the resin won't stick to it. You can see just how smooth and shiny the polypropylene sheet is. And I've already cut some strips of the sheet to act as the side barriers around the outside. First, I'll make sure the planks are lined up square and then use hot melt glue to stick the barriers in place. You'll want to use plenty of glue and ensure you have a watertight seal to prevent any resin leakage. 
I'll stick down some timber battens to provide support to the plastic barriers. Before we pour any resin at all, you want to give some thought to how we're going to clamp down the boards to make sure we take out any gentle curvature and also to stop the boards from floating on top of the resin. We're going to do it by using these standoffs and a piece of timber across the top and then we'll clamp it down to the table. I'll wrap some more of the flash release tape around these blocks to prevent them from sticking to the resin. It's also important, just before we pour any resin, to have a really good clean-up of any dust or dirt. We now need to work out how much resin we need for this river table. The nature of the Waney Edge board makes it quite difficult to get this exact. You could tip in a dry material, something like rice or sand, and then use that to work out the volume. What we're going to do though is take an average of the width along the table and then use that to work out what we're going to need. To calculate the volume of the river, we'll multiply the depth in millimetres by the length in metres by the average width of the river in metres. This gives us a volume of 9.12 litres. We'll round this up and estimate that we need 10 litres, which we can approximate to 10 kilograms. So the real key to success whenever you're working with resin and wood in a project like this is to do the process in two separate stages. The first stage is to pour a very thin layer so that we can seal the underneath of the wood and any exposed areas. The second pour is your main pour to bring it up to the top level. Our recommendation for this base layer is to allow two millimetres over the total area inside your barriers. We've worked out that we need 1.6 kilograms and this comes out of the total 10 kilogram requirement. As you can see, Glasscast 50 is an incredibly clear epoxy resin, but we've decided for our project we actually want to give it a striking blue tint. Because we're pouring the resin in a number of stages, we'll tint all of the resin now at the same time. The tint we're using here is one of the Glasscast translucent tinting pigments, and as you can see, we only need to use a few drops to achieve the subtle blue tint we're looking for. With all of the resin tinted, I'll measure out the correct ratio of resin and hardener to make up the 1.6 kilogram quantity that we calculated earlier for the sealing coat. And we'll carry on using the double potting procedure to ensure that no unmixed resin finds its way into our table. By pouring the resin onto the base first, we can ensure that a full sealing coat of resin is underneath the wood, avoiding the risk of air pockets under the planks escaping during the cure. I now use a brush to coat a thin layer of resin over all of the exposed faces of the wood, which is the live edge and the top surface. With all of the visible faces now coated, we'll put on the clamps that we prepared earlier. You can see some bubbles being pushed out as I use some gentle pressure on the clamps to press the planks down flat. Any excess resin that gets squeezed out can simply be wiped back into the river. Glasscast 50 is very good at releasing trapped air without any help, but it's still a good idea to use some light action with a heat gun to help the process along. We just need to leave this first layer to cure to what we call the B stage. That'll take around 12 hours at 20 degrees, so we'll come back to this in the morning. It's now the following day and we've come back to find that this is at the perfect B stage. When we're talking about the B stage, what we're referring to is the point where the resin feels firm but still has a slight tack to it. When you press your fingers onto the surface, it should feel sticky but there shouldn't be anything on your fingertips when you lift them away. However, it should just about be soft enough that when you dig your nail in, you can leave a slight impression. Once you're confident that you're at the B stage, it's really important to move on with the final pour immediately. If we'd allowed this resin to fully cure, we'd have had to key the whole surface before we could move on to that final pour. However, because we're at the B stage, no further preps needed. Because the depth of our table is 40 millimeters, I'm actually going to split the main pour into two separate stages, allowing the resin to cure to its B stage between each pour. This will avoid the risk of the resin overheating whilst it cures, which is a problem that we could face if we tried to do the main pour all in one go. We'll keep following the double potting procedure for all of the remaining resin mixes. The 2 to 1 by volume mix ratio makes this next mix simple. 
I'll mix up three litres of resin in total, so two litres of resin and one litre of hardener, to bring me just past the halfway depth. Be careful when you're using the heat gun to only warm the resin very gently. It doesn't take much at all to clear the bubbles. We've now filled our river to about the halfway point, so we'll leave this now at least overnight to partially cure and come back and mix the final batches tomorrow. So before proceeding with the second half of the main pour, make sure you've checked that the previous pour has cured to its B stage. I'll also use this last mix to fill any knot holes or cracks on the top of the planks, in the same way as we did on the underside. With the final pour now finished, we just need to leave the resin to fully cure. This will take at least 48 hours at 20 degrees, and it's really important in that time to maintain the temperature throughout, and keep dirt and dust away from the surface. It's a couple of days later now, and as you can see, the glass cast 50 is cured to a really hard finish. That means we can now move on to the final stages of finishing this table. Looking down through the cured resin, we can see that that combination of the sealing coat and the glass cast 50 have given us no air bubbles and no air entrapment. However, we don't yet have the surface finish that we're looking for. There are a number of ways we could finish this table. If we were looking for a perfectly flat, glossy finish, the easiest way would actually be to abrade the surface and then use our Glass Cast 3 surface coating resin. But we've decided for this project, we actually want a natural appearance to the wood. There are even a number of ways we could do this. We could use the sander that we used earlier on, or if you've got access to the equipment, you could simply put the whole table through a thicknesser. However, the way we're going to do it is to set up a bridge and then use a router to give us a perfectly flat surface. You can probably tell that this simple bridge was just put together using some offcuts of wood, but it will do a nice job of allowing us to route the top of the table to a consistent thickness. This first pass shows how nicely the glass cast machines. I just kept making a pass with the router and then moving the bridge along. It took a little while, but to achieve the really flat finish I wanted, I think it was worth it. So as you can see, the router's left us with this really uniform, flat surface. All we need to do now is use the sander to make it nice and smooth. You can see here how easily these polypropylene barriers come away from the resin. As you can see, the finish from the polypropylene sheet is really quite good. And as this is the underside of the table, we're not going to do anything else to it. We'll use an orbital sander to make light work of finishing this top face, starting with a coarse 80 grit pad and then working through the grits up to 1200. Apart from the polishing, I'm happy now with the surface of this top, so I'm going to take it over to the saw room where I can tidy up the edges and do the cuts for the mitred legs. To bring these leg sections together with our top, we're going to use a special clear epoxy adhesive. The flash tape is also perfect for this job because it's very strong and the resin won't stick to it, so it makes the perfect hinge for our mitered corner. This Permabond ET500 is a perfectly clear epoxy adhesive and is incredibly strong, so it's ideal for creating our glass-like mitered corner. With these side pieces now clamped securely in position, we'll leave this glue to cure for a few hours. Now that the adhesive's cured, we can remove the tape. To enhance and protect this natural finish that we've got to the wood, we're simply going to use Danish oil. This will also help to seal the wood prior to that final polish of the resin. Follow the application instructions for your chosen finish. 
We're now at the very final stage of the project. We just need to polish this glass cast resin to a high gloss to reveal the amazing clarity. I'm using this Pi Crystal NW1 polishing compound, which is intended specifically for hard plastics like epoxy. Providing that you did a good job with the abrasive paper, it shouldn't take long with a power polisher to bring the glass cast river up to a full gloss. So there we have it, our finished resin river table. This has been a really fun project and the glass cast 50 has given us this stunning result. So if you've got a similar project in mind, head down to your local timber merchant and order your glass cast 50 online. Almost all the materials used in this project are available from the Easy Composites website for worldwide delivery. If you'd like even more in-depth information, use the link on screen to download a free, full version of the Resin River Table Handbook.